First, I would like to express all of our appreciation to Poem Present, or Present, <laughs> I never can get that right, the School of the Art Institute Masters of Fine Arts Program in Writing and the Center for Latin American Studies for sponsoring this event, as well as the WBEZ program Chicago Amplified for recording the reading. In addition to the radio broadcast, the recording will be available um, on the Poem Present website, poempresent.uchicago.edu, and on the WBEZ website, chicagopublicradio.org slash amplified. Second, so as not to interrupt unduly the flow of a proper introduction, tonight Clayton Eshelman will be reading a series of transla translations from each of the four books of poetry included in the complete poetry of Cesar Vallejo, which you can see back there on the table. Um, it, the books are The Black Heralds, Trilce, Human Poems, and Spain, Take This Cup From Me. And I will, on occasion, read selected poems in the original Spanish. After the reading, Clayton will kindly entertain questions and a reception will follow. And I also would like to remind everyone that tomorrow he will also be giving a lecture at 1 p.m. in Stuart 101. So, I am, if one may be permitted, an understatement, a great, exuberant, an uninhibited lover of Cesar Vallejo's poetry. A good deal of my colleagues and students, as well as some complete strangers I may never meet again, can well attest to the fact that this is indeed an understatement. And as we all must know, since we are here, there are many ways to love poets and their poetry. I will not limit the parameters of love, but one may at least read, one may study, one may discuss, one may rewrite, as anxieties, even those of influence, can most certainly be a part of love. And one may translate, with the latter two, as Borges would have it, being perhaps the same in kind. And this evening, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Clayton Eshelman, a long and steadfast lover of Vallejo's poetry, a lover of many hues whose brightest color perhaps is the even still heated blush of the translator. He began translating Vallejo at Indiana University in the late 1950s. And if one were being cliche, this would be, of course, the flush of his youth. And wrote the culminating coda to this long-lasting affair when he completed the present volume, The Complete Poetry of Cesar Vallejo, just published by the University of California Press with a foreword by Mario Vargas Llosa and an introduction by Efrain Cristal. As luck would have it, a kind and rather innocent Celestina if one could imagine it, who facilitated my own passionate attachment to both Vallejo and Vargas Llosa. So over these last nearly 50 years, while he wrote 16 collections of poetry, founded Caterpillar and Sulphur, received numerous prizes and grants for his poetry, research and translations, as well as followed his passions as a paleoarchaeologist, Clayton's ongoing reworkings of his Vallejo translations have preceded the current and complete poems of Vallejo, appearing in numerous literary magazines in two broadsides, as Human Poems published by Grove Press in 1968, as Spain Take This Cup From Me published by Grove Press in 1974, with Jose Rubia Barcia's co-translator, as the complete posthumous poetry published by the University of California Press in 1978, 
with Jose Rubia Barcia again as co-translator. In Conductors of the Pit, alongside translations of, translations of Rimbaud, Neruda, Césaire, Breton, Jolan, and Arto, with Soft School Press in 1988, and as Trilce, published by Wesleyan University Press in 2000. And perhaps this type of love might be the kind that could repeat the miracle of Vallejo's poem Massa, a miracle which we'll, we will hear repeated again today, that of coaxing the dead back to life with a collective call. In this case, the call of the translator that cries forth the corpus in a new language, in another land, among different people. So I'll begin by reading the first poem in Spanish. And this is from Los Herados Negros, or The Black Heralds. And the poem is the title poem. <clears throat> Los Herados Negros. Hay golpes en la vida tan fuertes, yo no sé, golpes como del odio de Dios, como si ante ellos la resaca de todo lo sufrido se empozara en el alma, yo no sé, son po pocos, pero son. Abren zanjas oscuras en el rostro, más fiero en el lomo, más fuerte. Serán tal vez los potros de bárbaros, atiles, atilas. O los heraldos negros que nos manda la muerte son las caídas ondas de los cristos del alma, de alguna fe adorable que el destino blasfema. Esos golpes sangrientos son las lacrepitaciones de algún pan que en la puerta del horno se nos quema. Y el hombre, pobre, pobre, Vuelve los ojos como cuando por sobre el, hombre, el hombro nos llama una palmada. Vuelve los ojos locos y todo lo vivido se emposa como charco de culpa en la mirada. Hay golpes en la vida tan fuertes, yo no sé. So this is the uh, title poem from Vallejo's first book, published in Lima, Peru, in 1918. Black Heralds. There are blows in life so powerful, I don't know. Blows as from the hatred of God, as if, facing them, the undertow of everything suffered welled up in the soul. I don't know. They are few, but they are. They open dark trenches in the fiercest face and in the strongest back. Perhaps they are the colts of barbaric Attilus or the black heralds sent to us by death. They are the deep falls of the Christs of the soul, of some adored faith blasphemed by destiny. Those blood-stained blows are the crackling of bread burning up at the oven door. And man, poor, poor, he turns his eyes as when a slap on the shoulder summons us, turns his crazed eyes and everything lived wells up like a pool of guilt in his look. There are blows in life so powerful, I don't know. So a few more poems from 
the black heralds. Agape. Today, no one has come to inquire, nor have they asked me for anything this afternoon. I have not seen a single cemetery flower in such a happy procession of lights. Forgive me, Lord, how little I have died. On this afternoon, everybody, everybody passes by without inquiring or asking me for anything. And I do not know what they forgot and feels wrong in my hands like something that is not mine. I've gone to the door and feel like shouting at everybody, if you are missing something, here it is. Because in all the afternoons of this life, I do not know what doors they slam in a face. And my soul is seized by someone else's thing. Today, no one has come. And today, I have died so little this afternoon. The voice in the mirror. So life goes, like a bizarre mirage. The blue rose that sheds light, giving the thistle its being. Together with the dogma of the murderous burden, the sophism of good and reason. What the hand grazed by chance has been grasped. Perfumes drifted, and among them the scent of mold that halfway down the path has grown on the withered apple tree of dead illusion. So life goes, with the treacherous canticles of a shriveled bacante, completely rattled I push onward, onward, growling my funeral march. Walking at the feet of royal brahachmanic elephants and to the sordid buzzing of mercurial boiling, couples raise toasts sculpted in rock and forgotten twilights across to their lips. So life goes, a vast orchestra of sphinxes belching out its funeral march into the void. This is the final poem in Trilce. It has an odd title um, that many previous translators or all previous translators have thought was a coined term by Vallejo. I found it in a 1732 Spanish dictionary, um, Espergesia in Spanish. I translate it as epexegesis, and it means using a surplus of words for a fuller and embellished declaration. I was born on a day when God was sick. Everybody knows that I'm alive, that I'm bad, and they do not know about the December of that January, for I was born on a day when God was sick. There is a void in my metaphysical air that no one is going to touch, the cloister of a silence that spoke flush with fire. I was born on a day when God was sick. Brother, listen, listen. Okay, and do not let me leave without bringing Decembers, without leaving Januaries, for I was born on a day when God was sick. Everybody knows that I am alive, that I chew, 
and they do not know why in my poetry gold winds, untwisted from the inquisitive sphinx of the desert, screech an obscure coffin anxiety. Everybody knows, and they do not know, that the light is consumptive and the shadow fat. And they do not know how the mystery synthesizes, how it is the sad musical humpback who denounces from afar the meridional step from the limits to the limits. I was born on a day when God was sick, gravely. Well, we start with the first poem. Uno. ¿Quién hace tanta bulla y ni deje de estar las islas que van quedando? Un poco más de consideración en cuanto será tarde o temprano y si acalitará mejor el guano. La simple calabrina tesoria que brinda sin querer en el insular corazón. Salobre alcatraz a cada yoloidia grupada. Un poco más de consideración y el mantillo líquido se de la tarde de los más soberbios pemoles y la península párase por la espalda aposelada, apo, lo siento, aposeleada en pertérgita en la línea mortal del equilibrio. There are 77 poems in Trilce. They're Roman numerals, no titles. Um, I thought that I would read you a few notes on number one because they point up some of the translation challenges and aspects of Trilce, which is undoubtedly Vallejo's most complex book for reader and translator. Line one, who's making all that racket? Espejo writes that while Vallejo was in the Trujillo jail, inmates were taken outside to use the latrines four times a day. There the guards would coarsely urge them to hurry up. The first two stanzas of poem 50 indicate that this is not gratuitous but quite pertinent information. Looking at the first stanza of this opening poem, it would seem that the racket makers are the wardens and guards, and that the islands are the inmates' turds. For a study of the construction of this poem, see a translational understanding of Trilce I in my collection of essays, Companion Spider. Guano. The dried excrement of seabirds found mixed with bones and feathers on certain Peruvian coastal islands was widely used as a fertilizer. Guano workers visited the mainland ports and cities on their days off, and Vallejo would have been able to observe them not just in Trujillo, but also in the vicinity of the jail. For capital, based on tesoro, treasure, the word tesoria has provoked differing interpretations. Giovanni Meo Silvio identifies it as a neologism, incorporating the latter part of estercoria, excrement, influenced by the guano references in the stanza, as well as by the islands in the first. Ponk. The Spanish calabrina, meaning an intolerable, intense stench, is archaic. If I'd used the word stench, the translation would reflect the common Spanish word edor, Thus, the necessity in such cases of finding archaic English words or expressions for their Spanish equivalents. Muzzled. The Spanish abozaleada is based on abozalada, muzzled, with an E-A-R infinitive ending substituted for the standing A-R ending. Meozilio considers the word to be a neologism. Trilce 1. Who's making all that racket and not even letting the islands that linger make a will? 
a little more consideration, as it will be late, early, and easier to assay the guano, the simple for capital punk of brackish gannet toasts unintentionally in the insular heart to each hyaloid squall. A little more consideration and liquid muck, six in the evening, of the most grandiose B flats. And the peninsula raises up from behind, muzzled, imperturbable on the fatal balance line. Thirty six. Pugnamos en saltarnos por un ojo de aguja, enfrentados a las canadas, a maniocas, casi el cuarto ángulo del círculo. Hembra se continúa el macho a raíz de probables senos y precisamente a raíz de cuanto no florece. Por ahí estás, penos de milo. Tú manqueas apenas pululando extrañada en los brazos plenarios de la existencia, de esta existencia que todavía isa perenne imperfección. Ven usted, Milo, cuyo cercenado, increado brazo revuélvese y trata de encodarse a través de vertiantes cuijaros gagos, ortigos náutilos, Aún es que gatean recién vísparas inmortales, laciadora de eminencias, laciadora del paréntesis. Rehusad y vosotros a posar las plantas en la seguridad dupla de la armonía, rehusad la simetría a buen seguro. Intervenid en el conflicto de puntas que se disputan en la más torionda de las justas el salto por el ojo de la aguja. Tal siento ahora a Meñique de más en la siniestra. Lo veo y creo no debe serme. Y por lo menos que está en sitio donde no debe. Y me inspira rabia y me, me asarrea. Y no hay como salir de él sino haciendo la cuenta de que hoy es jueves, se dé a nuevo en par potente de orfandad. This is Trilce number 36, which is about the closest thing that we have to an Ars Poetica, or theory of poetry from Vallejo at any point. The new odd number in the penultimate line, I argue in a note on Trilce, quite possibly refers to Trilce itself, that Trilce is Vallejo's new odd number. We struggle to thread ourselves through a needle's eye, face to face, hell bent on winning. The fourth angle of the circle ammoniafies almost. Female is continued the male on the basis of probable breasts and precisely on the basis of how much does not flower. Are you that way, Venus de Milo? You hardly act crippled, pululating in wound in the plenary arms of existence, of this existence that nevertheless is perpetual imperfection. Venus de Milo, whose cut-off increate arm swings round and tries to elbow across greening, stuttering pebbles. Ortiv Nautily, recently crawling evens, immortal, on the eaves of, lassoer of eminences, 
lassoer of the parenthesis. Refuse, all of you, to set foot on the double security of harmony. Truly refuse symmetry. Intervene in the conflict of points that contend in the most rutty of jousts for the leap through the needle's eye. So now I feel my little finger in excess on my left. I see it and think it shouldn't be me, or at least that it's in a place where it shouldn't be. And it inspires me with rage and alarms me. And there is no way out of it except by imagining that today is Thursday. Make way for the new odd number potent with orphanhood. This crystal waits to be sipped in the rough by a future mouth without teeth. Not toothless. This crystal is bread yet to come. It wounds when they force it and no longer shows animal affection. But if it gets excited, it could deposit honey and become a sugar mold for nouns which adjectivize in self-offerings. Those who see it there, a sad colorless individual, could dispatch it for love through the past and at most into the future. If it does not surrender any of its sides, if it waits to be sipped in a gulp and as transparency by a future mouth that will no longer have teeth. This crystal has passed from animal and now goes off to form lefts, the new minuses. Just leave it alone. A note on Trilce 75. Espejo, a Peruvian who wrote a memoir of Vallejo's Peruvian years, writes that on the 27th of April, 1920, we left the port of Callao on the steamer Ison for Salaveri, arriving on the 30th. At this time, Vallejo had with him in a binder most of the poems that would make up Trilce. His friends met us at the Trujillo station. Having just arrived from Lima, where he'd been embroiled in quarrels and agitation and in a constant flurry of activity, Vallejo was floored by the placid ambience and immediately seemed to lose, once and for all, his interest in Trujillo. At the same time, he discovered his old friends asleep on their feet, going through life as if in slow motion. The following day, he came to my house and read me the poem beginning, You're All Dead. You're all dead. What a strange way of being dead. Anyone would say you aren't, but truly, you're all dead. You float nothingly behind that membrane, that pendant from zenith to nadir, comes and goes from dusk to dusk, vibrating before the sonorous box of a wound that hurts none of you. Verily I say unto you, then, that life is in the mirror, and that you are the original death. While the wave goes, while the wave comes, with what impunity does one stay dead? Only when the waters crash against facing banks, folding and doubling, do you then transfigure yourselves, and believing you are dying, Perceive the sixth string that no longer is yours. You're all dead. 
having not lived ever before. Anyone would say that, not existing now, in another time you might have. But verily, you are the cadavers of a life that never was. A sad fate. But not having been, but always dead. Being a dry leaf without ever having been green. Orphanhood of orphanhoods. However, the dead are not, cannot be cadavers of a life they've not yet lived. They always died of life. You're all dead. Now we move to the human poems. Uh, the first of two of Vallejo's books were written, published in Peru. He goes to Europe in 1923 and feverishly works on the human poems in the fall of 1937 and also revises poems written earlier in Paris. Um, so the rest of the poetry you'll hear this evening was written in Europe, mainly in Paris in the late 30s. Telúrica y magnética, mecánica sincera y peruanísima, la tercero colorado. Suelo teórico y práctico, surcos inteligentes ejemplo, el monolito y su cotejo. Papales, cebarales, alfalfal, al, alfalfares, cosa buena. Cultivo que integra una asombrosa jerarquía de útiles y que integran con viento los mugidos, las aguas con su sorda antigüedad. Cuaternarios maíces de opuestos natalicios. Los oigo por los pies como se alejan. Los, los vuelo retornar cuando la tierra tropieza con la técnica del cielo, molécula exabrupto, atoma, terso. Oh campos humanos, solar y nutricia, ausencia de la mar y sentimiento oceánico de todo. Oh climas encontrados dentro del oro, listos. Oh campo intelectual de cordillera, con religión con campo, con patitos. Paquidermos en prosa cuando pasan en verso, cuando párense. Roedores que miran con sentimiento judicial en torno. Oh patrióticos asnos de mi vida. Vicuña descendiente nacional y graciosa de mi mono. O luz que dista apenas un espejo de la sombra que espida con el punto y con la línea polvo y que por eso acato subiendo por la idea a mi osamenta. Ciega en época del dilatado molle del farol que colgaron de la sien y del que descolgaron de la barreta espléndida. Ángeles del corral, aves por un descuido de la cresta, cuya o cuy para comer los fritos. Con el bravo rocoto de los temples, cóndores me friegan los cóndores. Leños cristianos en gracia, el tronco feliz y al tallo competente, familia de los líquenes, especies en formación basáltica que yo respeto desde este modestísimo papel. Cuatro operaciones os sustraigo para su salvar al role y hundirlo en buena ley. Cuestas en fraganti. Aunque Quenidos, llorosos, 
almas mías, sierra de mi Perú, Perú del mundo, y Perú al pie del orbe, ya me hiero. Estrellas matutinas si os aromo, quemando hojas de coca en este cráneo, y cenitales si de tapo de un solo sombrerazo mis diez temples, templos. Brazo de siembra, bájate y a pie, lluvia a base del mediodía, bajo el techo de tejas donde muerde la infatigable altura y la tórtola corta entre su trino. Rotación de tardes modernas y finas madrug madrugadas arqueológicas, indio después del hombre y antes de él. Lo entiendo todo en dos flautas y me doy a entender en una quena y los demás me la pelan. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful twisty ode. <clears throat> there is a number of notes on this piece, but um, I think it would slow down the reading to go into it, so I'll just read you the translation in this case. Telluric and magnetic. Sincere and utterly Peruvian mechanics, that of the reddened hill. Soil theoretical and practical. Intelligent furrows. Example, the monolith and its retinue. Potato fields, barley fields, alfalfa fields, good things. Cultivations which integrate an astonishing hierarchy of tools and which integrate with wind the lowings, the waters with their deaf antiquity. Quaternary maze with opposed birthdays. I hear through my feet how they move away. I smell them return when the earth clashes with the sky's technique. Abruptly molecules. Terse Adam. O oh, human fields, solar and nutritious absence of the sea, an oceanic feeling for everything. O oh, climates found within gold, ready. O oh, intellectual field of cordilleras, with religion, with fields, with ducklings, pachyderms in prose when passing, and in poetry when stopping. Rodents who peer with judicial feeling all around. Oh, my life's patriotic asses. Vicuña, national and graceful descendant of my ape. Oh, light, hardly a mirror from shadow, which is life with the period and with the line dust. And that is why I revere, climbing through the idea to my skeleton. Harvest in the epoch of the spread pepper tree, of a lantern hung from a human temple, and of the one unhung from the magnificent barrette. Poultry yard angels, birds by a slip up of the coxcomb, cavus or cavi to be eaten fried with the hot bird pepper from the templed valleys. Condors? Screw the condors. Christian logs by the grace of a happy trunk and a competent stalk. Family of lichens, species in basalt formation that I respect from this most modest paper. Four operations, I subtract you to save the oak and sink it in sterling. Slopes caught in the act. Tearful Ocania, my own souls, Sierra of my Peru, Peru of the world, and Peru at the foot of the globe, I adhere. Morning stars, if I aromatize you burning coca leaves in the skull, and zenithal ones, if I uncover with one hat doff my ten temples. Arm sewing, get down and on foot. 
rain based on noon under the tile roof where indefatigable altitude gnaws and the turtle dove cuts her trill in three. Rotation of modern afternoons and delicate archaeological daybreaks. Indian after man and before him. I understand all of it on two flutes and I make myself understood on a cana. As for the others, they can jerk me off. This is one of uh, the two sonnets in Human Poems, originally published in 1939 in Paris by the poet's widow. After many, many years, I've managed to half rhyme the sonnet. Uh, I don't think it's possible to rhyme a sonnet like this and to not change the meaning but I feel that it's kind of a half triumph by, because I think sonnets should be rhymed. I, you know, a number of American poets write 13, 14, and 15 line poems and call them sonnets. I'm sure you can all think of some of them. I don't think so. I think a sonnet is really a little kind of engine of sound and sense and uh, the rhymes have to be there. So this is sort of Vallejo a la Emily Dickinson or something like that. <laughs> Intensity and height. I want to write, but out comes foam. I want to say so much, and I mire. There is no spoken cipher, which is not a sum. There is no written pyramid without a core. I want to write but I feel like a puma. I want to laurel myself, but I stew in onions. There is no spoken cov which doesn't come to broom. There is no God nor son of God without progression. For that then, let's go eat grass, the flesh of sobs, the fruit of whales, our melancholy soul canned. Let's go, let's go, I'm struck. Let's go drink that already drunk. Raven, let's go fecundate your mate. That piece is dated 27 October 1937. The next poem was written the following day, or finished the following day, or typed up the following day. We, we don't know. Uh, we don't know. Vallejo died before these poems were published. And they were left in a typed manuscript with many hand corrections. So we don't know what he would have kept. We don't know if he would have done more work on the poems that have the corrections. We'll never know. Guitar. The pleasure of suffering, of hating, dyes my throat with plastic venoms. But the bristle that implants its magic order, its taurine grandeur between the first string and the sixth and the mendacious eighth, suffers them all. The pleasure of suffering. Who? Whom? Who? The molars? Whom? Society? The carbides of rage in the gums? How to be and to be here without angering one's neighbor? You are worthier than my number, man alone, and worthier than all the dictionary, with its prose in poetry, its poetry in prose, are your eagle display, your tiger machinery, 
bland fellow man. The pleasure of suffering, of hoping for hope at the table, Sunday with all its languages, Saturday with Chinese Belgian hours, the week with two hawkers, the pleasure of waiting in slippers, of waiting cringing behind a line, of waiting empowered with a sick pintle, the pleasure of suffering, hard left by a female, dead with a stone on her waist, and dead between the string and the guitar, crying the days and singing the months. Untitled, 6 November, 1937. There are days there comes to me an exuberant political hunger to desire, to kiss tenderness on both cheeks, and there comes to me from afar a demonstrative desire, another desire to love, willingly or by force, whoever hates me, whoever tears up his paper, the little boy, the woman who weeps for the man who was weeping, the king of wine, the slave of water, whoever hid in his wrath, whoever sweats, whoever passes by, whoever shakes his person in my soul. And I desire, therefore, to adjust the braid of whoever talks to me, the soldier's hair, the light of the great, the greatness of the child. I desire to iron directly a handkerchief for whoever is unable to cry. And when I'm sad or happiness aches me, to mend the children and the geniuses. I desire to help the good one become a little bad, and I have an urge to be seated to the right of the left-handed and to respond to the mute, trying to be useful to him as I can. And likewise, I desire very much to wash the cripple's foot and to help my one-eyed neighbor sleep. Ah, to desire this one, mine, this one, the world's, interhuman and parochial, mature. It comes perfectly timed from the foundation, from the public groin, and coming from afar makes me hunger to kiss the singer's muffler, and whoever suffers to kiss him on his frying pan the deaf man fearlessly on his cranial murmur, whoever gives me what I forgot in my breast, on his Dante, on his chaplain, on his shoulders. I desire, finally, when I'm at the celebrated edge of violence, or my heart full of chest, I would desire to help whoever smiles laugh, put a little bird right on the evildoer's nape, to take care of the sick, annoying them, to buy from the vendor, to help the killer kill. A terrible thing. And I would desire to be good to myself in everything. And one more from Human Poems, 9 November, 1937. The soul that suffered from being its body. You suffer from an endocrine gland. It's obvious. Or perhaps suffer from me, from my tacit stark sagacity. 
You endure the diaphanous anthropoid over there, nearby, where the tenebrous darkness is. You revolve around the sun, grabbing onto your soul, extending your corporal wands, and adjusting your collar. That's obvious. You know what aches you. You know what leaps on your rump, what descends through you by rope to the ground. You, poor man, you live. Don't deny it. If you die, don't deny it. If you die from your age, aye, and from your epoch. And even if you cry, you drink. And even if you bleed, you nourish your hybrid eye tooth, your wistful candle, and your private parts. You suffer, you endure, and again, you suffer horribly. Miserable ape, Darwin's lad, Bailiff spying on me, most atrocious microbe. And you know this so well that you ignore it, bursting into tears. You, then, were born. That, too, is obvious at a distance, poor devil. And shut up, and you put up with the street fate gave you. And you question your navel. Where? How? My friend, you are completely up to your hair in the year 38. Nicolas or Santiago, someone or other, either with yourself or with your abortion or with <coughs> me, and captive in your enormous freedom, dragged on by your autonomous Hercules. But if you calculate on your fingers up to two, it's worse. Don't deny it, little brother. You say no. You say yes, but no. Poor ape. Give me your paw. No, your hand, I meant. To your health. Keep suffering. And we'll end with three pieces from... Vallejo's sheaf of 15 poems concerning the Spanish Civil War. These were written at the same period of the human poems. They were published during the Spanish Civil War in an edition that was thought for many years to have been completely destroyed. It turns out that one copy was found in a monastery in the early 1990s. So the first edition on that level survived. The regular first edition was published in Mexico in 1940. So uh, these are Roman, Roman numeraled also, and this is section four, the fourth of 15 poems. The beggars fight for Spain. Begging in Paris, in Rome, in Prague. Thus authenticating with an imploring Gothic hand, the apostles' feet, in London, in New York, in Mexico City. The mendicants fight satanically, begging God for Santander, the combat in which no longer is anyone defeated. They deliver themselves to the old suffering. They glut their fury at the foot of the individual by weeping social lead. And they attack with moans, those beggars, killing by merely being beggars. Pleas of the infantry, in which the weapon pleads from the metal up, and wrath pleads this side of the wrathful gunpowder. Tacit squadrons which fire their meekness with mortal cadence from a doorway, from themselves, aye, from themselves. Potential fighters without socks when shooing thunder. Satanic, numerical, 
dragging their titles of strength, crumb under belt. Double caliber rifle, blood and blood. The poet hails armed suffering. Number eight. The figure in this piece, a man named Ramon Collar, there is no biographical information on him. Uh, we think of him as a peasant soldier in defense of Madrid, on the part of the Republic, of course. Back here, Ramon Collar, your family carries on from rope to rope one after another, while you visit, you out there, at the hour of seven swords in Madrid, at the Madrid front. Ramon Collar, ox driver and soldier, even son-in-law of his father-in-law, husband, son bordering the old son of man. Ramon of Sorrow, you, brave Collar, paladin of Madrid, and by sheer balls, <coughs> Ramonete. Back here, your folks think a lot about your combed hair. Anxious, quick to cry, during the tear, and during the drums, they walk. They speak before your ox, during the earth. Ramon, Collar, to you. If you are wounded, don't act up when you succumb. Restrain yourself. Back here, your capacity for cruelty is in little boxes. Back here, your dark trousers, after a while, finally know how to walk in utter solitude, how to wear out. Back here, Ramon, your father-in-law, the old man, loses you each time he encounters his daughter. I tell you that back here, they've eaten your flesh without realizing it, your chest without realizing it, your foot. But they all brood over your steps crowned with dust. They've prayed to God back here. They've sat on your bed talking loudly between your solitude and your little things. I don't know who has taken over your plow, don't know who went after you, nor who returned from your horse. Back here, Ramon Collar, at last, your friend. Greetings. Man of God, kill and write. Amen. No nos dejes valor, vuelve a la vida. Pero el cadáver ahí siguió muriendo. Acudieron a él veinte, cien, mil, quinientos mil, clamando tanto amor y no poder nada contra la muerte. Pero el cadáver ahí siguió muriendo. Le rodearon millones de individuos con un ruego común. Quédate, hermano. Pero el cadáver ahí siguió muriendo. Entonces, todos los hombres de la tierra le rodearon. Les vio el cadáver triste. Emocionado, incorporóse lentamente, abrazó al primer hombre, echóse a andar. Number 12, written on the 10th of November, 1937. Mass. At the end of the battle, the combatant dead, a man approached him, 
and said to him, Don't die. I love you so much. But the corpse, alas, kept on dying. Two more came up to him and repeated, Don't leave us. Be brave. Come back to life. But the corpse, alas, kept on dying. Twenty, a hundred, a thousand, five hundred thousand appeared, crying out, So much love and no power against death. But the corpse, alas, kept on dying. Millions of individuals surrounded him with a common plea. Don't leave us, brother. But the corpse, alas, kept on dying. Then all the inhabitants of the earth surrounded him. The corpse looked at them sadly, deeply moved. He got up slowly, embraced the first man, started to walk. Questions or comments? Why? We'll be glad to respond. Tomorrow, I'm going to read something called a translation memoir, which will go into considerable detail uh, about the various aspects of this 48-year translation saga. So if you have things in your mind that might somehow fall into that area, why it might be best to come to the program tomorrow and then we can talk about that afterwards. That, I mean, I don't say that to you know, <laughs> silence you, but uh, just to mention it. Yes? I'm glad you're off the question, but I'll ask after a Okay. No, go ahead, please. <laughs> I just wanted to know okay. what Vallejo was doing between 1922 and 1927, presumably. Oh, uh, he went to uh, Europe in 1923. Uh, a friend uh, had a first-class boat ticket, and he cashed it in for two third-class tickets and took Vallejo. Uh, Vallejo was mainly very poor from, for several years. Uh, I think he was really very close to being a street person his first few years in Paris. Uh, then he began to write for uh, Lima newspapers and magazines. Uh, he got a grant from the Spanish government. Um, he had a girlfriend for several years, and then he met his, the woman who was to be his wife and who has made life miserable for Vallejo translators and scholars for many, many years. Uh, she died in 1984. Uh, I met her in Lima in 1965 when I went to Lima for about eight or nine months. Um, so he was mainly in Paris. He made, he made a couple of trips to Spain to pick up his grant, and at one point, because of his communist activities, he became a communist in the late 20s. Uh, the French government made him leave Paris, and he lived for a couple of years in Madrid. He also made three trips to Russia and wrote two travel books which are probably his least interesting writing. They are very agenda-driven. And of course, one of the great things I feel about the human poems is that they are profoundly political poems, and they are not agenda-driven. So somehow he was able to keep agenda out of his poetry, but it really took over those two particular travel books, which have never been translated, and I don't know that they will be. So there's a lot of journalism that's been collected but not translated. There's four plays and there's many letters. So the literary production is considerably larger than the poetry. So in a nutshell, why? You'll find also an up-to-date chronology in the back of our book by Stephen Hart, who is a Vallejo scholar from 
London. Bob. Can you reflect a little bit on what, on what it's like to, uh, well, read the translations, but to write the translations too, because in a sense, you're writing poems in English that can't be written in English, uh, in, in this sense that the first poems you read, there are not two or three poems include statements of life and then a predicate. Can you write those poems yourself in your own voice? Is that a level of style that's accessible to you and to your contemporaries as American poets? Wow, that what a question. I mean, that's a book. Yeah. <laughs> I just um, asked you to reflect on it. Well, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that there is a, well, I think that The Black Heralds is a potent first book, and a book that still has some very <coughs> interesting reverberations today. It also has a kind of dated feel to it in the struggle with sexuality and God that, of course, Vallejo has to get out of his system to some extent to be able to go on ahead to drill it. So I personally don't identify much with the Black Heralds, and I'd always stayed away from the Black Heralds as a Vallejo translator and didn't you know, have to deal with it until I finally decided it was time for a complete poetry. Uh, one of the reasons that I stayed away from it is that much of the poetry in it is rhymed verse. And, you know, rhymed verse is a real trap for a translator because, as I quickly said, talking about one of the sonnets in the human poems, if you translate it and rhyme it, why you turn it into something like, I don't know, Robert Lowell turned Rambo into in imitations, you know, with several translation errors per line, but it rhymes. And so I stayed away from it also because I didn't think it was as potent as the rest of the writing. But then again, I had to take it on to, to do this book. No, I, I, my primary, ident primary identification with Vallejo is with the human poems, which is the first book that I translated. And I worked on the human poems when I was living in Kyoto in the early 60s. And I took it on as my apprenticeship to poetry. Um, I had a, a, an experience with a friend named Will Peterson, who was a lithographer who came to visit me one day. Now, keep in mind, I'm about 25, 26 at this time. And he comes late, and I said, oh, where have you been? And he says, well, I've been over to this bonsai gardener. He said, he's starting to do some very interesting work. And I said, oh, I said, well, how old is he? He said, well, he's, he's in his early 70s. And I said, what do you mean he's in his early 70s and just starting to do some early work? Well, Will said, well, he's been an apprentice. And of course, this had never gotten into my sophomoric American head that there was really anything such as an apprenticeship. So I decided, well, maybe it would be smart for me to figure out a way to apprentice myself to poetry and not try to, you know, in some kind of dopey way, try to write great poems without knowing how to write poems. So Vallejo was my apprenticeship, and I imagine that the human poems have gotten under my skin more than any poetry that I've read or worked with, more than any poetry, certainly in English. Um, I mean, the, the long reading of the, the, the shuttling back and forth between the text and the dictionary. I mean, I've spent more time with Webster's International Dictionary translating Vallejo than I have reading Ezra Pound or Hart Crane or Charles Wilson. So, in other words, one is always, to extent, as a poet translator, one is working on one's own imagination when one is translating, especially when one makes the kind of identifications that I made with the human poems. I mean, this could go, go on for some time, but maybe that's some, some thoughts about it. Yes? The French translations fit in with your uh, history. French, well, uh, I, I discovered uh, Aimé Césaire's work in the 60s, and um, I, w I became aware that the Notebook of Return to the Native Land was a terrific poem. And it had been translated before, but I thought that I might be able to do a, a better job. So to make a long story short, I teamed up with Annette Smith, who was a professor at um, Caltech. And we first translated Césaire's Notebook, and then we went ahead to translate 
virtually all the rest of the poetry. The collective poetry of Aimé Césaire came out in 1983. I also discovered the work of Antonin Artaud in the 60s. I mean, my generation, which sort of came into poetry in the 60s, we were really big international readers. And it's one of the things that I'm very proud of, that we were reading poetry in translation, learning to translate at the same time that we were reading American poetry. So uh, I, I realized that Artaud was very special. And uh, at a certain point, I decided I would do some Artaud. And that is Watch Fiends and Rack Screams that came out in 1995. Um, those are the other two you know, big projects outside of Vallejo. I've translated a few poems by some other French writers, but nothing on that order. Yes? I understand that you have a A kind of English that does what against the Spanish? Leans, Leans against the Spanish. I mean, I love the candidate um, as opposed to Duke. Well, you know, like, well yes and no. I mean, the so capital punk is clearly my invention of something that could be contested. I mean, if somebody stood up and said, that's a terrible translation, it has nothing to do with Vallejo, I, I would defend myself, but I could only defend myself so far. But my argument would be that at least I've tried to capture the spirit of the difficulty, and I've tried to put the reader in somewhat the same position that the Spanish reader is. You know, I mean, to give the American reader an identical wall in that phrase. To what extent this is my own creation, I mean, it is and it isn't. I mean, that's, I guess, you know, when you're translating something that is literal and not hard to translate, I don't think it's that much of your creation. When you're translating metaphors and words in which there are, you know, several meanings of the word, any of which may be true, since we don't have Mr. Vallejo to talk to here, right? We can't debrief him about the human poems, right? Then there's a certain kind of creative, poetic aspect that comes in, in which the choice that you make has a certain kind of your own identity involved with it. Yes? In the same thing, there, that neologism, that's such a major part of that, his work. Um, yes, and also arcane and, and, and biological words. Biological words. Yeah, yeah. So there are two Fauna and flora. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Where he's using Latinate phrases, and you, and you figure that if you if you use a Latinate phrase in in an English way, it just sounds, you know, no, it doesn't sound right. And so you try to find something that's between. Um, but I mean, there's nothing like Trilce. I mean, Trilce is by far the most difficult thing that I've ever I've ever translated. And uh, <laughs> I mean, there's about a half a dozen poems in Trilce that I really don't understand at all. <laughs> but I don't think there's many people walking around on Earth that do either. So I think I'm in fairly safe company. Yes? If you have a book about translation, you publish the book of it? Yes. The Complete Poetry, bilingual, right back there. Just published by the University of California Press. The whole enchilada. <laughs> Is another poetry, another poem from Americas? Do you like it in Mexico or Argentina or some other Latin? I've been reading a lot of Gerardo Denise, who's a Spanish transplant, who's an old man now, lives in Mexico. He's Spanish. He's Spanish, but he's probably as Mexican as he is Spanish now because he's been there for 34 years. Yeah. I admire the writing of Octavio Paz. Uh, when I was in Lima, I knew people like Soldadura. Are you having in Lima? Yeah, I was there for nine months in 65, 66. Carlos and Armand Belli. Um, uh, Nika Norpara from Chile. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've read a lot of the 20th century Latin American writers, but my translation emphasis has been all of that. Are you having Neruda? Yes, I did some when I was a baby translator. I did, uh, I did some of the Residencia in La Tierra, the Residence on Earth of Neruda, which I still feel is maybe his best work. I love the Residence on Earth, especially the first two volumes. We have Peruvian, you know, and we can't be more. Happy to meet you, and you're not happy to I'm sorry to come here, we come from Skokie, you know, and we have problems with the trans. I know you're a bit 
can do some peace tour or something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we can't come tomorrow. You know, we have another. Well, I'm going to talk about my my relationship with Claudia tomorrow, but it's in the back of the book. Tomorrow, we can do another compromise. You know, with the Cervantes Institute of a book fighter. You know, uh -huh. yeah. I did a program for the Cervantes Institute oh, yeah, in New York oh, yeah. on the 14th of November. Yeah, it's yeah. tomorrow about book fight tomorrow. So it's <laughs> In fact, I read with a young Mexican poet named Monica de la Torre. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, she read the Vallejo and I read the Transfer. Well, thank you. Perhaps we can continue. Okay. Something to drink.